I've renamed this morning's lecture, When is a Network Not a Network? Uh, and I've got two epigraphs this morning. One is from a TV writer named Dave Hackle, the creator of Becker. Uh, and he says, I speak at a lot of places and people ask me, why isn't television better? I hate to be a cynic, but I reply, it is because you don't want it to be. They ask, what do you mean? I want it to be better. I then say, no you don't. You watch a bad show and buy the products they're advertising on it. It is your way of justifying what shows they are sending you on TV. You have the power to turn shows off, and that will ultimately change what's on television. Uh, and then, to quote Joss Whedon, the creator of Buffy and one of the great uh, TV figures of all times, with Buffy, I had a network, the WB, with no real identity that was willing to take chances to establish one. After I met with the WB, I called my friend and said, they were so nice, they respected me and listened to me. He said, yeah, they have no idea what they are doing. <laughs> we'll see that this uh, is the key to understanding uh, television. Uh, I thought I'd talk uh, this morning uh, about the relation of government regulation and movies and television. This issue has been coming up, uh, uh, but this morning I'll try to go into it uh, in some detail. Uh, you know, I've been talking about the commercial market as the basis for culture, uh, but uh, uh, I don't want you to think, and have sometimes corrected myself, uh, that I wasn't talking about uh, these markets as purely free markets. In fact, we've never seen purely free markets in England or America, even during these so-called laissez-faire uh, periods. Uh, and so when I talk about commercial markets, I'm, I'm talking about relatively free markets uh, and celebrating uh, uh, that degree of freedom. Uh, but it's interesting to compare movies and television to get a hold on how uh, government regulation affects the course of culture uh, because movies began uh, in an almost unregulated environment uh, whereas television from its inception uh, uh, has been in a government regulated environment we don't have nationalized television in the US but we've had a television industry uh, that has never been able to make a move without uh, taking a look at what the government's doing uh, uh, this is a mere fact of history that television starts right after World War II, basically, and movies begin uh, around 1900. Uh, so uh, movies, in a sense, had a double advantage uh, in that uh, uh, the whole of the United States was relatively unregulated in 1900. If you're talking about a free market era, it would be 19th century uh, the United States and uh, uh, we're just enter, you know, we're in the pro just entering the progressive era when movies are beginning, and and, the, and in addition to the fact that the economy in general was less regulated, you didn't have these vast bureaucratic organizations like the FCC uh, in place. Uh, uh, moreover, nobody noticed the movies when they began. Uh, uh, it's the saving grace for culture uh, that when new media come along. Uh, almost no one recognizes their importance, and certainly the government does. It ta usually takes the government a generation to figure out to regulate something. The Internet's a good case of that. They're, they're just, the government's now salivating to regulate the inter uh, Internet. But one reason it developed as well as it did is it developed under the radar uh, of the government, even though the government in some sense had created the uh, Internet. Uh, uh, but uh, this is true, say, of the personal computer industry as well. When you look at the most successful uh, uh, business enterprises in this country, the ones where quality keeps increasing and price keeps going down, they are almost always the unregulated areas, and they're often unregulated because the government, you know, entrepreneurs are at least a generation ahead of the government. Uh, so the, 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 the well, the movie business was incredibly free for all in its beginnings. No one had real models for it. No one knew what they were doing. And you see all sorts of things being tried out. It's one reason movies developed as 
quickly as they did into an art form is that it was a, you know, an almost completely free, unregulated environment, uh, both in business terms and artistic terms, uh, and that allowed people to experiment and develop things quickly. I want to stress the artistic aspect of it uh, as well. Uh, uh, I would make it a law of cultural history uh, that new media are created, are created precisely because uh, the old cultural establishment doesn't even notice that. I mean, for example, if you go back to 1800, uh, there was a huge uh, uh, body of criticism established for poetry, and poetry was thought of uh, as the central form of serious literature. And a, uh, forgetting about government regulation, a poet couldn't make a move around 1800 without feeling the entire weight of uh, two millennia of, of poetic achievement behind him and established critics. Uh, this would be exacerbated in places like France, where there was an academy of letters uh, and a real sense of, of what can and can't be done in literature. No one took the novel seriously in 1800. Uh, uh, there were not uh, critics of the novel uh, yet. There were no rules yet of the novel. Uh, uh, so in some ways, one of the reasons the novel surged beyond, beyond poetry as an artistic form at this point was no one was looking, no one was telling people what to do. Novelists, even just in aesthetic terms, were, it was, were completely free to innovate and experiment. And you, you see that at the beginning of a medium. When it takes off, uh, no one but the creators even notice what's happening. And that's why, in fact, you don't get gradual developments in the medium, but this, this Gould model of punctuated equilibrium where you get a sudden burst of creativity uh, and all sorts of things are tried out and then only gradually are the things that work uh, winnowed out. And that was certainly true of, of, of the motion picture. So for its first 20, 30 years, uh, uh, the motion picture industry, particularly in the United States, was incredibly inventive, experimental, uh, uh, and competitive. Uh, uh, and indeed, it's one of the great ironies that uh, uh, the U.S. government decided the industry wasn't competitive enough and eventually worked to break up uh, the studio system because it claimed uh, it was a monopoly. Uh, my definition of a monopoly is a business that is granted special privileges by the government. Uh, the government's definition of a monopoly is a highly successful uh, business whose competitors contribute more to the administration's campaign chest uh, than the highly successful company. Uh, but uh, again, it's so strange that the government felt it had to break up the movie industry, which it seems to me was one of the most competitive industries. Well, that may be why they really did want to break it up. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's really only in the 30s that the government starts paying attention to the movie industry. You've got these calls for censorship, which the movie industry answered by creating self-censorship. And then again, you start to get into these antitrust suits and so on. In other words, the movie industry had a nice 20, 30 years uh, to develop uh, without the government telling them what to do. And I actually figure that the... Uh, uh, business practices that the industry developed probably were rational because they were the product of a relatively free operation of the market. Uh, and so the vertical integration of the movie industry probably was a good idea, though I'm not completely sure of that. Uh, in that sense, the movie industry is a good illustration of the benefits of the free market for cultural production. Television is an entirely different matter because television has been regulated since its inception. Uh, basically, it comes into existence after World War II. The federal government had grown enormously by then. Uh, it had already had experience in regulating radio. Uh, uh, and so television never had that era of freedom that the motion picture industry did. Uh, and I'll just say that I think that's one reason why television was less creative in its first two decades than the motion picture industry was. Uh, the history of television is a history of deregulation. That's actually what I'm going to be talking about today, that uh, increasing 
freedom from government regulation by a proliferation of the ways that television can be delivered uh, now through cable, satellite transmission, and so on. I'm going to talk about the Fox Network as the great liberating force uh, in the history of television. But I think it's worth beginning with this fact that if you look at the movie industry versus the television industry, the more the, the, the industry that was less regulated from the beginning actually became an art form quicker. Uh, uh, now, in terms of the uh, regulation of television, it actually is a very good test case for us of the question of government-supported art versus market-supported art. Uh, because in most countries, uh, television was nationalized from the beginning. Uh, uh, the United States is one of the few countries that had anything like a free market, a competitive uh, commercial market in television. The tendency in Europe and in many other places was to have uh, a single national television uh, network uh, or maybe a couple of them. Uh, and this gives us, a, you know, it's like the old experiments comparing East Germany and West Germany. Let's see how socialism works, let's see how capitalism works. Well, let's see how public television works uh, versus how commercial television works. And I mean, con commercial television uh, just cleans up uh, in this comparison. Uh, now, it's certainly true that uh, uh, some national public television uh, systems have produced some good television programs over the decades. And people always hit me with the BBC. Uh, uh, if the commercial television is so good, why is the BBC so much better? I just advise those people to watch the BBC on a regular basis sometime and sit through uh, the 16 hours of a cricket match and sit through the investiture of the poet laureate of Wales sometimes, broadcast in Welsh. Uh, I might point <laughs> out. Uh, 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 now, the BBC has produced some great programs over the years. Masterpiece Theatre, but notice that title doesn't really point in the direction of television. Masterpiece and theatre point to prior culture. Indeed, what the BBC has been very good at is repackaging for television uh, things from the high culture of the 19th and early 20th century. You know, I love Brideshead Revisited. I think it's one of the great things ever produced for television. But ultimately, it's taking even Evelyn Waugh novel uh, and translating it into largely cinematic terms. Uh, uh, it isn't really specific to television. If you look at, as far as I can tell, all the artistic innovations in television, they come from American uh, uh, commercial television. And I'm talking about te technical aspects like developing the three camera mode of filming sitcoms to the use of videotape, so on. Uh, uh, I'm sure there's something that was developed elsewhere, but uh, uh, I'd like to know what it was in terms of you know, all the actual technical, technical innovations that give TV the look it has, the way it's produced. As far as I can tell, they all come out of the commercial network, uh, networks of, of America. In that sense, the entire world of public television in America as well and elsewhere is parasitic on the American commercial system. Uh, uh, and they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have the technical quality they do if it weren't for what uh, the commercial uh, TV of the U.S. is producing. And similarly, even in terms of subject matter, uh, you know, it, it was not a huge innovation in cultural history to bring Brideshead Revisited to television. Uh, 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 <laughs> bringing the X-Files to television was. That is, wh the real innovations in programming come out of the United States by and large there too, although uh, reality TV l largely comes from Europe. The, uh, uh, and oddly enough, a lot of the shows come from Dutch television. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe we can blame the rest of the world for some of the worst things on American uh, uh, television. But again, I'm not claiming that there's nothing of value that ever came out of non-commercial television. Uh, but the, the bang for the buck is, does seem pretty, 
pretty small. And some uh, people tend to lump together all foreign shows as coming from public TV. But in fact, uh, England eventually developed an independent net network. And the, the two greatest things to come out of British television as television are from ITV, uh, commercial network, The Prisoner, and The Avengers. Uh, so uh, probably, I, I guess, the best thing to come out of the BBC would be Monty Python. That's really specific to, to television. And, and then, the, you know, again, I, the, the BBC has produced a lot of good stuff. On radio, they created The Goon Show with Spike Milligan and, and Peter Sellers, which is one of the great cultural phenomena of the 20th century, probably the funniest thing ever produced uh, in, commercial, in, 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 in mass culture, although in this case it was through a, a public network. Uh, and again, as I keep saying, it's not that only commercial TV is good. It's just that his record is so much better in this case uh, uh, than uh, 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 various forms of public TV. And that's pretty obvious if you look at the American uh, situation. Uh, and again, uh, you know, public TV, insofar as it's good, is good at things like talk shows and documentaries and news shows. Uh, which is all very well and good and part of television, but to me it doesn't seem to be the aesthetic side of television, which would be the production of TV shows, dramas, comedies, and so on. Now to look briefly at the history of commercial television in the United States and see the impact that government regulation has had on it, uh, uh, from the beginning on the model of radio, television stations are licensed by the federal government. Uh, movie studios were not licensed by the federal government uh, when they were developing or even ever since. If you wanted to set up a movie studio, you did and you started making movies. Uh, uh, that was not true in radio and not true in television. The government early on made a decision that the public airways were a public resource and they, sh that should, they should remain, uh, in effect, owned by the government and simply licensed. Uh, we now think that was inevitable. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it was not. There were alternate uh, models possible. Uh, uh, the homesteading program with public land in the 19th century was a possible model. People could have been allowed to homestead uh, parts of the spectrum. And uh, if they made it work, they kept it. Uh, and if they didn't, <laughs> they would be off the air. And indeed, uh, probably it would have been uh, a better idea to privatize uh, the airwaves as soon as possible, turn them into private property, and then if you weren't uh, using the, uh, the band of the spectrum you had well enough, someone else would buy it from you and do a better job with it. That sounds crazy to us now. I don't have time to show you how that might have worked out, but there are a lot of arguments to say that if we'd allow, allow the airwaves to be homesteaded and turned into private property, we'd be a lot better off. Again, it sounds laughable, but that's basically how the United States treated public land uh, in, the, in the 19th century. Anyway, that's water under the bridge. Someday, maybe, uh, we'll have the, pri the true privatization of the airwaves. But uh, the major fact to understand uh, is if the government wants to take away uh, your uh, 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 broadcast uh, signal from you, they can. Uh, and that, above all, has, has kept all the networks in line. That's why they do these public service things. And there's various things they have to do to get your license renewed. Uh, any TV station, any radio station, periodically has to get its license renewed. As you may know, they all keep logs with testimonies from people in the community, what a good job they're doing, and so on. Uh, and all of the FCC regulations follow from the fact, that, you know, the ultimate threat, the sword of Damocles in broadcasting is that they'll take your license away from you. Uh, uh, but moreover, uh, there are a whole series of laws uh, that govern the structure uh, of uh, uh, TV networks. Uh, and again, the fascinating thing is the government's obsession with not allowing vertical integration uh, in the TV industry, just as it objected to vertical integration in the movie industry. Again, uh, with movie studios in the classic era of the 30s and 40s, 
the movie studios had a production arm, a distribution arm, and in effect a retail arm. They produced the movies, they distributed them, and they owned their own theaters, and they showed their movies in their theaters. Now, I don't know if that, you know, uh, is written as the 11th commandment, that that's the way the world should be. It is a system that evolved under relatively free market conditions, and I assume uh, it had reasons. Many industries are vertically integ integrated. There's a lot of logic to, to uh, bring together production, distribution, and retail. For one thing, it allows a lot of feedback uh, in both directions uh, to, so that the producers know that they're producing what uh, the retailers are, are, uh, think should, will sell and so on. And, you know, for example, the oil industry is vertically integrated. It's a common form of industrial organization. But for some reason, our beloved federal government decided this could not be and uh, forced the studios to sell off their uh, movie theaters uh, 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 roughly around 1950. And Hollywood has never been the same since, and many people think it's been uh, 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 worse off ever since. Uh, similarly, uh, the core of the federal regulation of television has been to avoid vertical integration as much as possible. Now again, think of uh, the situation here. Again, we have the production of television shows, we have the distribution of marketing of them, and then we have the delivery or broadcasting of them. Uh, now, uh, uh, by now, uh, uh, because of deregulation, the industry has become increasingly integrated vertically. But the, the, in the 50s, as television emerged, one of the key rules was uh, that no network could own more than five stations itself. That was a limit on vertical integration. Uh, what that meant was, well, let me put it, the money in television is not in production, it's in broadcasting. To produce shows, you've got to spend a lot of money and risk a lot of money, and the returns uh, are uh, very difficult to predict. Uh, uh, the one thing that is very easy to predict is you will always be able to sell airtime to advertisers. Uh, the cash cows in the television industry are the actual stations themselves uh, who ha you know, buy the programs and broadcast them and sell time to advertisers or in cable charge directly to subscribers. Uh, uh, so what everyone really wants is the TV stations. Uh, but the federal government set a, a limit uh, that you could only have five sta own five stations, and the rest would have to be independently owned. Uh, the result was, there, the, in the 50s, there were five huge television markets. I, I think it was, you know, it was New York, Chicago, L.A., I think Washington, D.C., whatever it was. Basically, the, the networks we know were created by buying or forming there are five stations in the five big markets. And moreover, this will sound very quaint to you, but getting a spot on the dial that had the best signal. Uh, it happened to be channels two, four, and seven, I believe, which is why in New York City, CBS is channel two, NBC is channel four, and ABC is channel seven. Uh, and this gave a tremendous, whoever got in first, had a tremendous advantage. One, you wanted uh, each of your, your allocated five stations to be in uh, the five biggest markets, and you wanted to get the best spot on the dial. This is largely the reason why, for decades, we had three networks and three networks only. Uh, it's very complicated. They started off, there were four networks, and then only uh, CBS and NBC, and ABC came into existence. Uh, a little later, and always was kind of the poor stepchild of the, of the big three. But again, it's, for the youngsters among you, it's probably hard to imagine the days when basically there were just these three networks. Uh, for much of the 50s, 60s, even well into the 70s, uh, the three networks uh, had 90% of the prime time audience. I mean, they now have under 50%. 
and it's probably approaching 40%, and it can't shrink fast enough in my view. Uh, uh, but uh, I just want to suggest that this, the fact that three networks were able to dominate the way they did, uh, you know, had st there were other reasons for it, but one of the reasons was the structure of the industry that federal regulation had created in saying how many stations you could own uh, 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 in any case. Uh, Another impact that the federal government had, another negative impact it had on the content of television. Uh, uh, in the so-called golden age of television, which is the 1950s, uh, the networks actually had very little to do uh, with programming uh, and even with production. They did produce, you know, they had their news shows, uh, they had their late night shows, uh, they had their morning shows and things like Today and Tonight uh, developed in the 50s, and, and uh, uh, the Tonight Show, for example, is the most profitable show in the history of television. At various points, it's accounted for 25% of NBC's profits. But uh, most of the shows uh, in prime time were developed uh, independently, and the way it was largely done was you got someone to sponsor your show, uh, and the net, you then just bought time on the network uh, to uh, show the show. So, uh, again, most, <laughs> probably too young ever to have seen any of this, but in the 50s, you know, M Milton Berle's show was the Texaco Milton Berle hour, although there was, a, there was the Colgate Palmolive hour. I mean, Sponsors were simply identified with the show. What happened then, so you wanted to do a television show, you got your own sponsor. You approached someone like Texaco, and you got them to put up the money, and you produced the show, and then together you bought time on NBC to broadcast it. But you, NBC was only, or the, the networks, were only in the business basically, in addition to the, the, the shows they produced for themselves, they were basically brokering time on the networks. In, I think it's 1961, the then chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, Newton Minow, after whom the boat in Gilligan's Island is named, the reason that's named the Minow is that Sherwood Schwartz hated Newton Minow. Uh, Newton Minow famously called TV uh, a vast cultural wasteland. Uh, and he wanted to do something about it and put uh, great pressure on the networks to clean up their houses. That's, it's in the early 60s that the networks decided they had to become in charge of programming. Uh, and they stopped this practice of a sponsor being able to just buy time and show whatever the sponsor wanted. And it's in the 60s that the sort of classic television pattern developed, developed of programming departments in the big three networks. And as Sherwood Schwartz has said, uh, suddenly Three men were in charge of everything that appeared on American, well, 90 percent of what appeared on American television. Uh, the programming heads at uh, NBC, ABC, and CBS. Uh, that regime, which we think of as sort of the classic television regime, is the product of government intervention. Uh, 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 and especially, yeah, especially the fact that now, to get your show on the air, you had to approach a network to show it. The network would then get the sponsors for it. Uh, and uh, Sherwood Schwartz talks about this in his autobiography, that suddenly you went from a situation where you had sort of every uh, big corporation in America as a potential sponsor for your show to having to convince one of three men to let your show on the air. Uh, he claims that that really dampened creativity in television. Uh, that the access to TV was much greater in the 50s when all you had to do was find your own sponsor and you could get on the air to a situation where suddenly the, the uh, networks were exerting their power determining what would be uh, a program. So it is kind of interesting that what everybody calls the golden age of TV was a product of, in effect, a less regulated uh, marketplace. And again, when TV was more experimental, it, it settled into its, uh, uh, the mode we uh, mostly think of in the 60s, and w which, w which was the great era of 
broadcasting, that is that, that these networks wanted the broadest possible audience uh, and therefore uh, they pitched their shows to the lowest common denominator. And this is the era of Beverly Hillbillies and Green Acres. You know, you have one show where a uh, country from the rural south goes to Los Angeles, and that seems to be working. Hey, let's have a show where a family from Los Angeles goes to the rural south. And it really creative programming, uh, it was. And again, I don't, I, there were some great shows in the 60s. Gilligan's Island, for, no, no. Uh, Gilligan's Island was itself the product of this regime. But, but, uh, 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 in retrospect, one reason for what now looks to us like a lack of creativity in television is that there was a lack of experimentation. This again, everything was processed, uh, being processed through three central points. Uh, now, it's not as bad as what you had in countries with only one station, especially if that one station was essentially controlled by the government. Uh, but three stations is better than one, but it ain't enough. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, through a series of uh, government uh, regulations and interpretations of that regulation, the, the uh, television industry in America grew increasingly centralized, especially in terms of what was being programmed. Now, that's where, where Fox comes in, Rupert Murdoch comes in, cable TV comes in. What has caused the great creative explosion uh, in American television is the gradual breakdown of that three network regime. Uh, and a lot of people participate in this, but no one deserves uh, more credit than that billionaire tyrant, as The Simpsons calls him, Rupert Murdoch, uh, who saw that a fourth network was possible. Uh, uh, and I mean, I lived through this and I remember how laughable it seemed to everybody that this Australian was going to create a fourth American network. And no one laughed more than ABC, NBC, and CBS uh, at the, as it was always called, the fledgling Fox network. Uh, uh, now, one of the things that shook up television uh, was new technological possibilities. Uh, the fact that television needed to be broadcast over the airwaves and the government refused to allow airwaves to become private property uh, and simply license them out uh, meant that uh, access to the airwaves was very difficult. Uh, you, could, you couldn't just buy it. You, could, uh, you, you had to uh, uh, get a license and people would, were sitting on licenses uh, which were licenses to coin money in a way. Uh, uh, and so as, uh, as cable developed and then satellite transmission, it of course changed the picture because there were now uh, alternate ways to deliver uh, television and uh, uh, potentially infinite numbers of them. Again, it, there's no one planned this. It's again a case of a spontaneous order development. Cable originally was developed simply for places where the broadcast couldn't be received, for mountain communities, places in some deep valley or something. The original idea was you only had cable uh, because there was no other way to get the TV signal to you. Uh, it actually became advantageous in Manhattan because of all the tall buildings. Broadcast transmissions were, had always been difficult to, to receive in Manhattan and, and so on. Uh, but nobody developed cable with a view to the Sopranos and Curb Your Enthusiasm and HBO Boxing. Uh, 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 it was really originally just a solution to a technical transmission problem, but we're talking about markets here, and so very quickly people started to see that there were new possibilities for programming once you could bypass the tyranny of the three networks. Not really a tyranny, I have to admit, but I'm just being a little dramatic here. Uh, 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 so a whole series of things broke down what my left-wing colleagues would call the hegemony of the three networks uh, that persisted you know, up through the 70s. But Rupert Murdoch and Fox is the, 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 the key uh, player here because they managed to establish a fourth network. 
uh, in, in broadcast TV. Now to do that, they used a lot of UHF stations, uh, 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 which had poor signals uh, and were sort of the stepchildren. Uh, Fox was referred to as the coat hanger network for years because uh, uh, to get in UHF you need this kind of weird shaped antenna and if it didn't work you tried a coat hanger. Uh, 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 now the, uh, the interesting thing about Fox is how innovative it truly was, uh, both in terms of programming uh, and in terms of a creative use of government regulation. Uh, uh, and my whole point here is that Fox uh, shook up television programming because for commercial reasons they knew they had to. From the very beginning they understood that you couldn't become the fourth network by simply becoming the fourth network. They couldn't just imitate what ABC, CBS, and NBC were doing. In fact, they realized that their opportunity was that ABC, NBC, and CBS had become too much like each other. And so they did a lot of studies, and here's a quote from one of their, uh, the guys who did the studies for them. Uh, what we found was a tremendous vacuum, essentially. Every viewer had a problem with every network. They would say things like, they canceled my favorite show, or their shows are all the same, or they only do one show that is hit, and then everybody copies that. There was a very strong theme of very repetitive complaints about the three networks that indicated to us that if we had innovative programming, if we had programming that focused on particular age groups, if we had programming that pushed the edge, if we had programming that we really stood behind, then we thought we could really appeal to a very strong need and interest that the consumers were indicating to us that they had. And, you know, a lot of thought went into the development of the Fox network. I mean, today it's part of history, and uh, again, for the younger ones among you, it's like established part of your life. Uh, but uh, there was a time when nobody thought Fox had any chance of succeeding. Uh, uh, and they succeeded, I mean, partially because Rupert Murdoch was willing to throw billions of dollars at it and, and take an enormous risk. Uh, uh, to develop it uh, when everyone was telling him he was crazy to do it. But also because they thought outside the box. They didn't just think, well, the way to have another network is imitate the three existing networks. Uh, and so all along they operated differently from the other networks. Uh, and I'm going to give you uh, <laughs> a, 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 some examples uh, uh, of that. Uh, just the way they ran the network. Uh, uh, they ran it seeking feedback all along. Uh, uh, they, were, they operated more by trial and error than the established networks. And of course, the networks were sitting pretty. They had 90% of the audience. Things seemed to be so, going great. They, got, they had gotten complacent, and they were used to doing things the way they'd been doing them for 15, 20 years, they saw no reason to change. They would plan out a whole season in advance and uh, uh, let it go and see, you know, at the end of the year, maybe reconsider. Fox, from the beginning, met every week to see how things were going. And uh, uh, the executives would have these sort of mass meetings at Fox headquarters and bring in everybody from the accounting department, from the sales department, and listen to them. And here's an account. This is when Barry Diller was uh, 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 running uh, Fox. Uh, he said that the people in programming who had enough trouble being second-guessed by Diller, Kellner, and Rupert Murdoch suddenly found themselves at these meetings dealing with comments from all sides. A woman in the accounting department says, I'm really upset about the way women are treated on Married with Children. Well, the program department has worked this all out, we said, and we have rationalized it, and we understand that it's a retro thing and surreal and postmodern. And what the hell is the accounting department woman saying she's very upset about how they're treated unmarried with children? Uh, they didn't like the feedback. Nobody likes to be told what to do, but they did listen. Uh, and indeed, uh, <laughs> uh, that's why Married with Children lasted nine seasons. Uh, uh, 
Uh, and again, one of these uh, Fox executives says, I, this is all from this wonderful book, The Fourth Network by Daniel Kimmel, which really gives you insight in how television actually operates. I, this is someone saying, I think the idea of having everyone in a company around a table once a week to talk about what they watch on television, what's good, what do you not like, what do you like about what we're doing, is a great way to get everyone's feedback. Because television is one of those businesses where everyone has an opinion because everyone's a customer. Indeed, Ansier felt it was healthier for the, healthy for the programming department to hear from their coworkers. But it's hard because people generally don't want to speak their mind about programming for fear of upsetting others when, in fact, we need honest feedback. Now, I've been saying this ever since the Victorian novel, uh, that what's really healthy in culture is a feedback mechanism. And that, again, isolating the creators from their audience is a bad thing. Uh, and what I'm saying is one of the characteristics of Fox that made it work uh, is they sought out feedback and created uh, uh, institutions that provided it. Uh, so, so, for example, there's this great dialogue between one of the programming people and Barry Diller, who's then the head of the network, uh, uh, where uh, uh, the programmers were pushing cops which is still on, <laughs> with a great success. But Barry Diller didn't want it, the head of the studio. Keneally insisted that the grittiness and toughness was a major selling point for the series and would help Fox where it was weakest on Saturday nights. Why do you fight for this show, Diller demanded at one meeting. Why do you always bring it up? Keneally replied, because people watch it. Diller's response was as deadly as it would prove ultimately to be ironic. People will watch car accidents, too. Do you suggest we program those? <laughs> and, of course, the rest is South Fox history and the world's wildest police videos. <laughs> Barry Diller inadvertently invented a whole genre there. But I think these stories are marvelous and illustrate how television actually operates. Uh, uh, but um, I won't read all of this, but basically it goes on to suggest that in part because Barry Diller came from the movie industry, he shook up the whole way television operated. Every week he met and evaluated what was going on and what worked and what didn't work uh, and tried to figure out if the ratings were because the show was good or because it had been promoted a certain way. And so Fox began to turn on a dime. Uh, again, you, uh, networks used to... Uh, it was rare for a show to be canceled mid-season in the classic era of the big three networks. They basically made a decision, they went with the show, at the end of the season, they might decide to cancel it. You know, Fox, uh, you aired on Tuesday, you were canceled by Wednesday, in many cases. Uh, uh, and now, by and large, everybody has imitated these means of Fox, but the, uh, Fox increased the pace of television decisions because they had to. They were putting such garbage on the air. They had to yank it uh, immediately. Uh, so uh, th this is one way it succeeded is it broke the rules of television. It also, have, however, exploited the rules of television. And here's the amazing thing I discovered in reading this book. The Fox network succeeded ultimately for only one reason. Uh, it was not a network. Uh, in the eyes of the federal government. Uh, that is, it turns out that according to the FCC, the definition of a network is someone who puts on 15 hours of programming uh, a week. Uh, and Fox did not. Uh, as you know, to this day, Fox doesn't have programming from 10 to 11 uh, at night. And in its earliest days, it didn't even attempt to program all the nights of the week. Uh, and Fox, for for the key years stayed within that 15-hour limit, which then made them exempt from the then-current FCC regulations. Above all, it meant Fox was not limited to owning five TV stations. Uh, uh, and even though it, it, uh, the, uh, the prime stations had long been occupied by the three networks, Fox was at least able to own more stations than any of the networks. They weren't as good, but additively, Fox ended up uh, with its own, uh, with its network owned, so, I shouldn't, with its network owned stations, it was able to cover more households than the three networks did. Moreover, another 
FCC regulation, which applied to networks, which means only to uh, entities producing 15 hours a week, uh, was the so-called uh, 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 syndication finance rule. That is, in another attempt to break up vertical integration, the FCC uh, did not allow a network to have a financial interest in the syndication of any show, including shows that it produced itself. Uh, that's why, for example, CBS at one point had to s spin off its syndication arm into a corporation called Viacom. The real money in producing shows is in the aftermarket, selling a show into, a, into syndication. Uh, you know, that's the whole business why a show uh, wants to reach 100 episodes, because that makes it eligible for syndication in the eyes of uh, 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 stations buying them. Uh, 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 especially the bulk of independent stations uh, don't have any network affiliations. What they do is show reruns of old network shows, you know, like Seinfeld, like Friends now. Uh, and the, the huge money, the billions of dollars, are in selling those shows. And for a long time, the networks were not allowed to do that, uh, again, by this FCC regulation. Fox, which has a heavy production arm, because it's linked to a movie studio, uh, uh, had a huge interest in syndicating its own shows, and was able to because it stayed within this 15-hour limit. Now, it got very complicated uh, at times when they approached it. That, uh, uh, Fox was very good at manipulating the FCC in this regard. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the FCC said that uh, UHF stations count only half when it comes to the hour limit and so on because they have weaker signals and so on. And uh, At the same time, but at this point, the, the other networks uh, were uh, outraged uh, uh, and they who had denied that Fox ever could become a network were now saying, hey, it is a network. <laughs> Apply the same rules to them. Anyway, I don't want to get into the details of this or the morality of it, the ethics or the legalities of it. I just do want you to get some sense of how key uh, this minefield of government regulations is. Uh, and that when you talk about you know, the free market in TV, it's a bit of a joke. Uh, but the point here is that the Fox Network was very good at finding its way uh, through the minefield. There's one uh, uh, a passage I really do feel uh, I have to read you uh, about it, if I can just find it now. Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, well, no, I can't find it now, so I have to skip that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, Fox became a success in part because it exploited uh, the, uh, uh, the rules that, uh, that govern television, in part because they were just very shrewd in terms of uh, 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 taking on the other networks. Uh, they were very good at counter-programming. They actually pursued what would be known as a rollout strategy. Again. Many people trying to create a fourth network would have said, we have to have programming every night like the other networks. Fox made a conscious decision, we're just going to go after Saturday and Sunday night. Uh, if our Sunday night programs click, we'll go to Monday night. If our Saturday night programs click, we'll go back to Friday night. As it happens, Sunday is what clicked, uh, and they moved to Monday and so on. But they built the station, almost, the network, almost night by night. Uh, and again, they were very smart in their sense of not trying to take on too much at once and realizing the only way to do this uh, was to do it gradually. On the other hand, so in some ways they went step by step. Um, in other ways, they made incredibly bold moves, like buying the NFL away from CBS. Uh, that cost Murdoch a fortune uh, and was not at all worth it financially. Uh, he knew he was going to take a bath on that. Uh, that he paid so much for the NFL rights that he could never recoup it on advertising. But he uh, had, had a very far-sighted vision and realized that it was worth taking the loss on NFL football to establish Fox's credibility, that for people to look at it as a network, while all the time he was keeping it from becoming a network technically, uh, he needed something big like the NFL. He also realized that the NFL uh, uh, was cheap 
as an advertising platform for all his other shows. That even if he wasn't going to make enough advertising revenue from selling time, uh, he could use the NFL shows to, to promote the whole Fox lineup. And again, that, uh, he wasn't the first to see that. The, the, uh, I think ABC was the first to understand the value of the Olympics in that sense, that uh, ABC always took a bath on the Olympics uh, in terms of sense, but used it to promote uh, its fall lineup. And uh, <laughs> that's why the Olympics was moved to August at some point <laughs> in history. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Fox was very clever uh, in the business end uh, of this whole uh, system, but also in the creative end. And this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to talk about the connection between commerce and cultural uh, creativity uh, here. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's important to see that uh, Fox turned all its disadvantages to an advantage, and the result was programming history. Let's look at The Simpsons and the X-Files in this respect. We viewed some sample episodes last night. And, you know, I have a, when I tell you that Shakespeare is the greatest dramatist ever, you believe me. When I tell you Dickens is the greatest British novelist ever, you believe me. I understand that when I tell you that The Simpsons and the X-Files are the greatest television shows ever, maybe you don't believe me. Uh, and, I, and this is the problem with dealing with contemporary culture. The canon hasn't emerged yet, uh, but I, you know, there are a lot of people that agree with me on this. Uh, uh, the market agrees with me. Again, we we don't have to say greatest, but they're, they're two genuinely great shows, uh, and they are shows which uh, already are standing the test of time. They're shows, uh, you know, <laughs> Simpsons the best comedy, The X Files the best serious drama. Uh, they, uh, they certainly are shows that achieve commercial and critical uh, uh, respect. Uh, in many ways, uh, I think I'm safe in saying that they were the signature cho shows of the 1990s, that the shows that most define that period uh, are the, the Simpsons and the X-Files. And what is astounding is to realize is that they were on Fox. Uh, that is, up to that point, I mean, all the signature shows uh, were on one of the three networks. Uh, uh, and now it's actually incredible how few of the defining shows uh, on television are on the networks. They've begun to rec re recuperate because they've begun to Im imitate Fox and the cable channel. But, you know, for the 90s and well into the 21st century, really the truly innovative, creative, defining shows were coming out of HBO and Showtime and Fox. Uh, 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 again, the networks, the old networks realized what they were doing wrong and now have adopted most of the business practices uh, or lack, lack, lack of business ethics of Fox uh, uh, and are now sort of coming back into the picture. So it's interesting that shows like Lost and Desperate Housewives are, are, are on ABC, but Fox is you know, still in there with the, uh, you know, 24 and the, the prison break. Uh, uh, but uh, I think it really says something about the change I'm talking about in television, uh, that uh, the defining shows of the 90s were on Fox. Uh, and that's because Fox had to do something different. So if you look at these two shows, you know, both of them seem so improbable, and I guarantee you that no network would have shown them uh, in the 1990s. Both violated long-standing television rules at that point for prime time. No animation, no science fiction. Uh, there hadn't been a prime time a cartoon show since the Jetsons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we know Jeff Tucker is the world's expert on that show. Uh, uh, and uh, there had been very few sci-fi shows and no successes. And I mean, it was one of the most common rules in programming department. Uh, uh, I don't want to hear about a cartoon. I don't want to hear about a sci-fi show. In fact, Fox had tried a show called Alienation, which in many ways is a predecessor of the X-Files, but it had failed. Uh, 
And so it was really daring to put these shows on, but it's easy to be daring <laughs> if you got nothing else to do. I mean, uh, uh, Fox, re I mean, uh, they were not going to uh, compete with the networks by just imitating what the networks were doing. They had to try something different. And The Simpsons was uh, appearing on the Tracy Ullman uh, comedy variety show uh, in two-minute segments. Uh, and uh, it sort of caught the eye of some people at Fox, and uh, James Brooks was producing that show, and they got the idea, okay, we'll try to do a half-hour version of it. They didn't have much hopes for it, uh, but why not give it a shot uh, and, and see what happens? Similarly with the X-Files, uh, uh, it's very interesting that going into that season, uh, Fox was pinning its hopes on the adventures of Briscoe County. That was on at 8 o'clock, and the X-Files was going to follow it. The X-Files almost didn't make it onto the air. Uh, they re Briscoe County was going to be the big hit, and so they had some time to fill after it. Briscoe County barely lasted one season, uh, and the X-Files made it. It's interesting, in both case, everybody takes credit for both uh, programming, both shows. Uh, it does appear that Murdoch was personally involved in, in both shows, that... He, he screened The Simpsons, he screened uh, The X-Files, and, and gave the go-ahead. Uh, I think if I'd been in that position, I would have given a go-ahead to The Simpsons. I already liked it from the two-minute segments. I'm absolutely sure that seeing the pilot of The X-Files, I would have said, you've got to be crazy to program this thing. Uh, it took me almost two years to get to like the show. And I am really, really impressed uh, with people like Murdoch who can make decisions like that, especially when they're risking their own money. Uh, it's very easy for academics uh, to, to make decisions and call the shots because they're not risking anything. They're also, they're so cocksure of themselves and they're usually so wrong. I just noticed, look at this wonderful book, Global Television and Film by Hoskins, McFadden and Fitt, which is by business school professors and it's better about television than anything I've read by cultural studies professors. It's really knowledgeable and yet uh, it contains this line, because Independence Day was a blockbuster in 1996, we know that we can expect a sequel in 1998, and even if that does not do particularly well, we are still luck likely to see part three released in the year 2000. Forget about it. Uh, I mean, notice how confidently they say that. We're professors, we know the logic of sequels, Independence Day was a blockbuster, they don't even, you know, uh, they barely hedge it. Uh, and I've seen this so many times uh, in the books I've been reading when professors think they've second-guessed the industry, and they absolutely know what will happen. That's why they're professors, <laughs> and they're not uh, executives uh, in the entertainment business. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, here's Fox uh, f faced with uh, a whole schedule to fill, a whole 15 hours, and so they keep trying things out. And some things worked, some things didn't. Uh, they were very quick to turn around. Uh, on the other hand, they did have uh, some f faith in their shows. The X-Files is a good example where uh, uh, it didn't do that well the first season, either critically or in terms of ratings, but something did feel right about it, uh, and they kept it on. And there's a show that built gradually. Again, I, you know, I'm saying that one of the things Fox did was to cancel shows quickly when they weren't working, but there's another side to it, that they were willing to nurture some shows that they, for one reason or another, had faith in. Party of Five was another example uh, of that. In the case of the X-Files, there was the odd fact that if, it may not have been doing so well on television, but it was doing spectacularly well on the Internet. Uh, uh, this is the absolute beginning of any connection between the internet and television. Uh, but what Fox noticed uh, was that this show was being talked about on the internet, that there were all sorts of websites about Fox created a website for it. It was getting more hits than any other show on television. 
It was by no means the highest rated show on television by far. But in this weird new form of rating, it, it and get this, it was getting 25,000 hits a, a week. You know, that was big in those days. And that was big, for, big enough for someone to notice. Uh, and so it's really interesting that uh, uh, Fox was willing to say, you know, there's something happening here. We're not quite sure, but we'll let it go another season. And in fact, the show, uh, it, it really is a case of a show uh, that built a kind of grassroots momentum, much as Star Trek did, but notice Star Trek still ended up being canceled, the original one on, on NBC after three seasons. Uh, if the X-Files had been on a network, it probably would have been canceled after one season, maybe after two or three. Uh, the point is that the way Fox transformed uh, the television scene uh, is that it simply established more outlets for creativity on TV. Again, if you go back to what Sherwood Schwartz was saying about the uh, big free network regime, the problem was you'd gone to a situation where uh, uh, you basically had to convince one of three entities to put your show on the air. If you couldn't convince ABC, you went to NBC. Well, actually, let me get this right. If you couldn't convince CBS, you went to NBC. And if you couldn't convince NBC, out of desperation, you then went to ABC. Uh, but that was it then. If you couldn't convince one of those three networks to put your show on the air, uh, you were out of luck, except finally, starting in the 70s, people started to independently syndicate shows, produce shows that went directly into syndication and bypassed uh, prime time showing and so on, but still, uh, very few outlets. The mere fact that you suddenly had a fourth opportunity with the Fox network was very important. Uh, and then uh, the, the, uh, uh, the UPN came along, the WB came along, they're now merging into one. Uh, we'll have five networks starting in the fall. Uh, but beyond networks now, we started to get the cable channels uh, uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, players themselves in the market. And so this has formed what I feel is the true golden age of television. We are living in the golden age of television. Uh, I actually grew up in the 50s and I remember the golden age of television and I remember it fondly and now that we have DVDs you can see uh, Sergeant Bilko again and you can see the Sid Caesar show and they're very good and they hold up. But a lot of the golden age when you see it now looks laughable because the production values were so bad uh, uh, and in many cases these shows that we remember so fondly were not so great. I don't want to denigrate it, but uh, in retrospect, it's looking very limited by comparison uh, with, with current uh, television. It is interesting here again that uh, uh, academics, like all human beings, are so nostalgic. And for example, there's a, there's a very good book by a man named Thomas Hibbs called Shows About Nothing. Uh, uh, it's largely about Seinfeld. And it's very good. I, I think he fundamentally gets it wrong. He, he, he thinks Seinfeld was celebrating those characters, whereas it was deeply criticizing them. And he criticizes the show for being nihilistic when I think it was, you know, uh, a, a kind of diagnosis of the pathology of nihilism. Uh, but in any case, uh, one thing he does in that book is to compare Seinfeld unfavorably with I Love Lucy. Uh, and it is, you know, oh, back in the 50s, shows were so great. There was I Love Lucy, and now in the 90s, we have degenerated to Seinfeld. Now, I Love Lucy was a very fine show. It holds up very well. It's very, very funny to this day, largely because of the talents of Lucille Ball as a comedian. It was a very important show in the history of television. This, uh, Desi Arnaz, who was a genius producer, invented the so-called method of three-camera filming, which became the basis for most sitcom production since. So I don't want to run down I Love Lucy, but I got to tell you, Seinfeld is funnier and it's a lot more sophisticated. Uh, and I'd rather live in a world that produces Seinfeld than one that produces I Love Lucy. Uh, so stick it to you, Tom Hibbs, who's a very good friend of mine. We actually get along fine. But, but I do, it is interesting that I have to say about academics, that the golden age of culture is when they, whenever they were growing up. 
Uh, and it's like any other human being, uh, that the stuff you first liked somehow becomes your standard, and everything's always going downhill from there. Uh, and you know, nobody in the 1950s was holding up I Love Lucy as the ideal standard of cultural creativity. Uh, I would like to see that once, that what people now call golden age uh, was considered the golden age in its own day. And you know, I'm now saying we're the golden age of te television. You know, 40 years from now, people will probably uh, be saying that. Professors will be saying that. Uh, but other people will have moved on and be seeing what's so quaint. Uh, we're just talking about the nice fact the X-Files seemed to hold up last night. It, do it doesn't look dated, certainly not its production values. But anyway, this is a very common pattern cultural nostalgia, it's the driving force behind much of the critique of commercial culture. Because people forget the commercial basis uh, uh, of earlier art uh, and always are faced with the commercial basis of contemporary art. And so when they idealize the past period, they also write out uh, its, its commercial basis. As if I Love Lucy had pr pr been produced by the National Endowment for Arts, not with regard to any commercial considerations like this vulgar show Seinfeld uh, today. Uh, so in fact, what I'm claiming here, uh, the deregulation of television uh, uh, has opened up exponentially the creative outlets in the field. And in part, that was driven uh, by people like Murdoch himself, who in effect rewrote the rules. But eventually, the, uh, uh, the, uh, even the federal government uh, got the message. And so we've had, uh, we have had de de deregulation in some important forms. The, uh, the uh, syndication rule uh, has been uh, 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 scotched, and now uh, networks can syndicate uh, 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 their own shows. Actually, I finally found the passage I was trying to uh, read to you, and it, I, I will read you some of it, because it, it, it bears so well on the story uh, I'm telling uh, uh, here. Uh, the, uh, uh, at one point, Fox found another creative way to own more stations than it was legally entitled to. Uh, and NBC called this to the attention of the FCC uh, and Fox's senior vice president of government relations. Notice what you have to have in your corporation now, a senior vice president of government relations said, NBC is simply using the FCC to thwart competition in the marketplace. And that is so true. It's so true in these antitrust cases. They're always secretly brought by the business's competitor. Uh, uh, or they're the ones that are spurring the government on. So uh, things got very dirty between Fox and the other networks. Uh, one of the, uh, 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 Murdoch had to become an American citizen in order to own a TV network at all. And there was, there was touch and go at a certain point whether he could learn the Constitution fast enough to pass his exam and get the citizenship in time. There's a lot of... Uh, 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 legal infighting between Fox and the networks. And then there was this moment where they were setting up a kind of uh, uh, shadow corporation that was going to uh, own stations for them. The goal was clearly, uh, 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 this is the goal of the other networks, was clearly to hold up the license transfers of the TV stations to SF Broadcasting and tie Fox and knots in the process. Fox's problem was that, they were, they, the, uh, was that they were as creative on the legal and business side as they had been on the programming side. That's the thing I'm trying to show you here. They hadn't necessarily broken any laws. Uh, that's what the FCC would have to determine. But they had done a lot of stuff that hadn't been done before. Uh, Padden, this, uh, this uh, vice president for government relations, Padden recalled that SF Broadcasting had originally been set up as a limited liability corporation, an LLC, which would require different treatment under various laws than a standard corporation. I'll never forget, he says, counsel from one of the older networks said to me, he was huffing and puffing over this latest station move and said, why I've never even heard of an LLC. This was counsel for one of the other networks. I laughed and I said, you know, I don't think there's an FCC rule that limits us to forms of business organization that you've heard of. 
<laughs> That's a triumph of Fox. And again, I want to stress, it was both on the creative side uh, and the business side. So again, looking at the history uh, of the, the X-Files, uh, the show itself sought out feedback. And I was talking about this last night when we were watching the episode, that, that uh, uh, one of the characteristics of the X-Files is that the creators paid attention to the uh, what was appearing on the internet. And I, I, I'll repeat that example that when they had the first episode that had the lone gunman in it, these three nerds that helped Mulder out, uh, Glenn Morgan, who wrote the episode, was very disappointed in it. And he said, that's it, I'm not bringing these characters back. As you may know, they were, they were part of the staff. I mean, two of them weren't even actors, I think. That, uh, 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 but on the, in the internet lit up. Uh, put three computer nerds uh, on TV in the era of the internet, and who's going to love them? Uh, people who are on the internet. Uh, and so they decided, okay, we'll bring them back, and you know, the rest is history. Uh, they were a, a real much-needed comic relief uh, in the X-Files, and, and once got their own, uh, uh, eventually got their own series, though that didn't uh, succeed. Uh, but the point here uh, is that... Uh, as every form of popular cultural production I've been talking about, television is messy, uh, uh, it's trial and error, it's feedback. Uh, uh, Fox kept innovating. Uh, you know, so some of their first successes were uh, Married with Children, 21 Jump Street. I mean, these aren't exactly uh, candidates for the the Artistic Hall of Fame. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they had a show with Chris Elliott called uh, uh, Get a Life, which I really loved and thought was very innovative. It failed pretty quickly. Uh, but its track record ended up, actually, in the 90s, being better than that of the big three networks, who have had now had to catch up with it. Uh, and so television has operated just the way we saw movies operating, just the way we saw the Victorian novel operating, and really just the way the theater operated in Shakespeare's day. Again, this pyramid structure. Television produces a lot of garbage, uh, but that has to be the basis for the peaks, because no one can predict the peaks uh, in advance. It is just, it is really interesting to read uh, these gossip books uh, about television uh, uh, to see the real stories like uh, 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 Desperate Housewives. Everybody turned that show down uh, till, till ABC finally picked it up in a kind of desperation move. Uh, 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 the, you would think to read uh, the Marxist accounts of how powerful the TV executives are, you would think uh, that they're such geniuses that they always know a hit when they see it and always know a miss when they see it, uh, and in fact they don't. And that's why uh, several of these books I've read uh, have chapters entitled Revolving Doors. Uh, I can't even give you the sequence of the executives who ran the Fox network or the very, I mean, people were in and out so fast. Uh, uh, and that's very characteristic uh, of uh, the entertainment business. Turnover uh, in management is even hi is, is higher than in other businesses. It's just such a volatile area. And this is one uh, place where academics in general, and Marxists in particular, are very bad as cultural anal analysts because they look at frozen snapshots. Again, this is a place where we as Austrians understand what's wrong. Uh, they take a static moment and analyze it, and at a st they look for equilibrium, we would say. And if you look at just one moment in the entertainment business, you can say uh, NBC's on top, ABC's on the bottom, uh, the NBC executives are in control. Uh, it looks as if someone is in control of the whole system at any given moment. If you take a frozen snapshot of the industry, but if you let the camera roll, uh, you know, in a couple of frames, NBC's going to be on the bottom, and ABC's going to be on top. Uh, and executives are going to be in, and executives are going to be out. And in fact, no one's in control. It is a marketplace, and things are constantly changing. Why? Because this is an area where consumer preference is so volatile and so constantly changing. Uh, 
But uh, again, uh, Austrian economics allows us to understand that there never is an equilibrium moment. There's only movement uh, towards an equilibrium. But because the underlying demand is always changing, you will never reach uh, a, a frozen point with the evenly rotating economy of the entertainment industry. N no way. It is so volatile, uh, even from medium to medium. I mean, I, I you know, you look, uh, the youth among you, you, you probably accept the world of television as it is now. That there's cable, there's all these channels. Uh, so, uh, you know, that looks very different to someone like me who grew up in the 50s and uh, uh, saw the era of the three networks. I completely expect that television will be unrecognizable in another 20 years. I think it's going to be merging with the internet in various ways. I think DVD production, uh, is going to change it. Uh, people will be, will be producing direct uh, for DVD and marketing uh, shows directly uh, to the uh, consumer. I mean, if I understood this better, I'd be a Hollywood executive and wouldn't be wasting my time as an academic. Uh, but I just have some sense from looking uh, at the world in the past that I at least can tell you things are going to change radically. Uh, and I maybe can guess some of the ways uh, they're going to do it. I mean, again, first video cassettes and then DVDs uh, really changed uh, the picture in entertainment. The fact that if something failed in broadcast, it might recoup uh, in DVD. You know, a classic case now uh, is the, 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 sh the show Family Guy, which uh, uh, Fox canceled. It was so popular on DVD uh, that it got uh, 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 revived, and now I hear the same things happening for Futurama. Uh, what, what has happened basically is the market has opened up and broadened, and that's a good thing. What amazes me is many academics say it's a bad thing. I mean, I, you know, uh, I am just stunned at the stupidity of my colleagues, their denseness at times. I mean, you know, I've seen people give the, the exact same analysis that I've been giving, and that shows you know, a certain intelligence on their part, uh, but then it stops when they draw the conclusions. Uh, uh, they lament the lack of consensus now in television. Uh, it, Marxists get nostalgic about the era of the big three networks. Can't understand, they were big corporations. Uh, we should be thrilled to be rid of them, but no, I read these Marxist analyses, that are the, so it's the bowling alone argument. Uh, it's the viewing alone. Uh, uh, television used to bring us together. Now, not enough because there was three networks. We should have had one nationalized station. Group. But you know, three networks, we could settle for that. Uh, and now you get all these laments for the proliferation of outlets and TV. You know, America is coming to an end because the share of the three network news programs is in precipitous decline. Uh, and, you know, when Tom Brokaw resi uh, retired and Dan Rather retired, the end of an era. Uh, the network anchors used to bring us together. America had a common point to refer to. We all know what that common ideology we all referred to that was promulgated on the three networks. All the attacks, the vicious attacks on Fox News have to do with the fact that they're offering some kind of alternative political view of things. But I really, uh, I was really surprised to find uh, a fairly common opinion among cultural critics of television uh, uh, that this developing lack of consensus is a real problem for America. I think it's the greatest thing that's happening. Would there are more and more networks, or in fact, you know, just more and more outlets, and of course, the internet is replacing television as people's uh, source of news, uh, as we well know. And, and in other words, we're seeing a great decentralization. I feel if libertarians have any cause for hope. Uh, it is because of these developments in the media, these developments on the internet. We are seeing a profound decentralization. I mean, there have been so many political stories lately that have been affected by the internet where the standard 
party line, uh, the establishment line has been ripped to shreds uh, by the, uh, uh, the vigilance of the internet. Uh, you know, it's obvious to me that these are good developments uh, in all sorts of political ways, but also simply in creative ways. Here's my example of where uh, competition is good, and the more sources of competition, the better. Yet there's been so, you know, uh, we paid lip service uh, to competition in this country, though it seems, you know, the only people that are brought up uh, under antitrust laws are people who are competing successfully. Uh, uh, and, you know, again, the, the, what I tried to show you this morning was the way uh, the laws and the, the regulations of the FCC were basically designed to keep these three networks in place. Uh, and, and make it very difficult for anyone to compete with them. It was Murdoch's brilliance uh, that he figured out how to exploit that system to his advantage and make it more competitive. And, you know, in retrospect, everyone said, well, of course, Fox was going to succeed. Murdoch had all that money and so on. Uh, but uh, I, you know, challenge anyone else to have done it uh, or even to do it now. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the WB uh, was headed by a fired Fox executive, and it did okay, but obviously not as well uh, as Fox. And so you really do have to give uh, Murdoch a lot of credit in this process. And again, I want to stress the creative aspect of it, that he was a risk taker as an entrepreneur, and he introduced that risk taking element uh, into his network. Uh, and so Fox experimented in so many different ways. And so we got this pattern again that I'm talking about in culture. Culture is a messy thing. You get, you try out possibilities uh, and then some succeed. You've got to have a way of weeding out the failures. You know, that's the great problem with central planning and socialism. Uh, uh, that it, uh, uh, it doesn't allow for enough failures. The great thing about free enterprise is not so much that it, it succeeds, is that it, it allows for failures but then corrects for them. Uh, uh, and a free market can correct for failures uh, quicker. And you know what I tried to show you about Fox is they move quicker. If something was failing and they thought it was failing for real reasons, they dropped it more quickly than the other networks. Uh, did. Now, again, that was balanced by the fact that they did have some faith in some of their programs and would continue them. Uh, uh, and so the total picture now uh, in television has changed. The pace of change is faster. Uh, the sources of change are increased. This is what's released uh, uh, all these new possibilities. Now, some of it, obviously, in cable, the fact that you can use certain words on cable that you can't use uh, on broadcast TV or that you can show nudity on cable. Yeah, these, these are commercial advantages for cable. And the networks are increasingly getting bitter about this. And they're, they're pushing the envelope. Uh, I recall Janet Jackson pushing the envelope, for example. Uh, I predict within five to 10 years we'll be seeing nudity on broadcast television or, or something pretty close. We've already begun to see men's backsides on, on, on network television. Uh, and so uh, 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 there probably will be changes in that. Uh, but you know, that's an obvious example of which it helps to have uh, a new outlets. But again, the, uh, when you look at the risks that uh, Showtime and uh, HBO are willing to take, you see why they're at the uh, uh, cutting edge now. I think of, think of Seinfeld, the show which I love, Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, that's done by Larry David, who basically created and wrote Seinfeld. I like to call it Seinfeld without the censors. I think in that show we see what Larry David would have done uh, uh, if, uh, if he uh, hadn't had any constraints on him at a commercial network like NBC. So I th see things uh, opening up uh, in television, and this, uh, in, in many ways, television is the main thing people have in mind today when they complain about commercial culture. Uh, they see it as debased, uh, and their numero uno evidence is on television. Uh, and again, as in any cultural form, you can point to a lot of garbage on television, uh, but increasingly, there are an awful lot of successes to point to. I, I give lectures like this, and 
after everyone, someone comes up and says, uh, have you seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Or have you seen uh, 440 uh, or what? You know, uh, and I haven't seen that. There's too much good stuff for any one person to watch, though I'm trying. Uh, 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 but that's what happens when you let a market go. And again, uh, the, uh, in some ways, this opening up has been driven by businessmen themselves. It, it, in some ways, it's been a reluctant FCC realizing that its rules were now antiquated and that they were fighting battles that were from a generation uh, earlier. Uh, and so we, we're enter if we're not in the golden age of television, we're now entering it. And uh, I already see the serious academic treatment of television programs, the emergence of a canon of the great uh, television programs, and DVDs have become an engine of canonization. We know which are the great shows from the past by the ones that are issued on DVD, and you can actually tell by what kind of issue it is, whether it's a selection of the episodes, that's pretty weak. Uh, the, all of the episodes, that's a sign of pretty good canonization. The deluxe edition, that shows you the show is really canonized. Uh, and so I, you know, just as in, in 1930 or 40, no one would have thought of, very few people were thinking of movies as a serious art form. To this day, very few people are thinking of television as a serious art form, but I think it is, and we're beginning to recognize that, and, and television is uh, one of the uh, uh, most powerful proofs of the power of commercial culture. So I'll stop here and take the qu usual questions. Yes. What do you think about uh, Fox Network's uh, decision to cancel Fire? Uh, you know, uh, I think it was justified. Now, Fox did not treat Firefly. This is Joss Whedon's show, uh, the the sort of Western sci-fi show he did. Fox wasn't good to it. They didn't show the original pilot. They showed the episodes out of order. Uh, they, they might have had more faith in it, they might have promoted it better. Uh, I've, I honestly didn't think it was that good. I mean, I'm a great fan of Buffy and I liked Angel. Uh, uh, I, I have to say I didn't think, it, I, I think it was very weak in casting. I think Ron Glass was the only really good guy in that show. And I, to me, I never warmed up to the characters. I didn't like the movie either. Uh, so, you know, I, I, but you raise a good question. Uh, w let's put aside the specifics of Firefly. You know, I loved Get a Life, and they canceled that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this does happen. I, I am not claiming that, that commercial TV is perfect. I'm, you know, I'm not claiming that everything it puts on is good and everything it cancels is bad. It is messy. It cancels good stuff. It leaves on bad stuff. What I will say is I can't conceive an alternate, alternate way of doing it that would have better results. Uh, that if the answer to market failure here is that there had to be a government agency that renews or cancels shows, <laughs> if that were so, you know, things would be far worse than they are. So I, again, people demand perfection of the market and if they don't get it, they say, we need government control, or we need this, or we need that, response to market failure. Uh, I don't buy that. You're comparing systems with systems. Uh, and the point, you know, look at any other system for producing television, and we have alternate nationalized television networks. Their results don't even begin to compare in quality with what the market has produced. So again, I mean, there are many, I, I wept when The Tick was canceled, the live action version of The Tick. Now at least we now get it on DVD, but you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm saying to myself, you know, why, why are they canceling my favorite show? And everyone has that experience, but that's not a reason for canceling the whole system. Because you don't want to see what the alternative is, though if you do, watch Romanian TV sometime. Yes? Uh, several times this week you have uh, mentioned this pyramid. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of garbage, but basically speak. <laughs> yeah. Could you comment more about what, what, in what sense that's true, or what is the actual relationship between the garbage and the peaks? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a mixed metaphor here, but, you know, 
my basic point would be that only a shotgun technique works in culture, that you can't do precision shooting, that the only way to succeed in culture is to try out lots of things and see what works. And that inevitably produces far more failures than successes. That's the way all markets operate. If you look at the introduction of products and so on, you know, a hundred products fail for the one that succeeds. And, and, and it's the same, and television shows their products in that sense. Uh, but I'll take it a little further in that the failure is an educational experience. Uh, you learn from your failures. Most, uh, very few people succeed with their first project in television. And they will tell you uh, how they learn from their failures. And so what I'm getting at, again, the, the cultural model of most academics is akin to a socialist central planning model. That you, we are so brilliant and so in command of the facts uh, that we experts ought to be able to get it all together to begin with and ahead of time and simply produce quality one time after another and know how to avoid failure. You know, what I'm saying is, in fact, that doesn't work. Uh, and that you need a lot of garbage to produce something successful. Uh, uh, if for no other reason, just that you just need a lot of uh, garbage. But above what you therefore need is a feedback mechanism. That, that, that's what I'm saying. And markets provide feedback mechanisms. And I've suggested some of the ways in which feedback is built into the way television studios, television networks operate. And you know, Fox uh, was uh, more successful uh, and in new ways because it, it developed new methods of feedback. And so, I mean, that sounds better than my garbage dump pyramid <laughs> image, and maybe I shouldn't use that. Uh, but I, you know, it just, it's so hard to get that across uh, uh, when people, you know, they're all Monday morning quarterbacks. After they fact, yeah, they can tell you what succeeded, and they think they can tell you why. Usually they don't even know that. Uh, uh, but, you know, I would like some of these people to make predictions sometimes, and then we'll hold them to them, like these really intelligent business professors who are completely wrong about Independence Day. Uh, yes, Mark. Well, you mentioned how technology led to improvements in commercial television. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, this would be the point that TiVo allows you to screen out the commercials. And I, you know, I really don't see how the traditional pattern of television uh, programs broadcast, paid for by selling commercial time, that's being eroded, and I don't really think it will survive the 21st century. Again, we get so naturalized. Uh, I mean, you know, I can't tell you, you know, for people my age, uh, the three networks seem natural. You know, like Immanuel Kant would have shown why there are just three networks, there can't be two, there can't be four, like the, the, the categories of pure reason. Uh, and so, you know, when I look at DVD and, and, and look at the internet, and I can't imagine that there won't, I actually can't understand why already you can't, decide any program that's ever been made, you want to watch it, you dial in and you pay a fee and there it is. I, I can't imagine that won't be the pattern uh, eventually. I guess there are technical problems to that. But it is true when you listen to executives now, they are beginning to realize that their asset is their content, their library of programming. You know, Ted Turner, when he made that brilliant move to buy, was it MGM's? Yeah, MGM's package of movies. I mean, again, they're realizing their, their assets aren't the broadcast slots, and they aren't buildings, but their real asset is the movies, the pro that they can package and repackage and sell them in this way. And so, yeah, I think uh, TiVo's got to spell the beginning of the end of something. Though It's surprising. It hasn't had the dramatic effect that people thought uh, it, it, it would. Uh, uh, but still, yeah, I agree, agree with you. I can't, I can't see how this commercial-based regime, that is not, not, not in the specific place of this ad, selling commercial ads-based regime, 
uh, will survive much longer. And obviously, it's you know with these uh, subscription networks like HBO and uh, uh, Showtime. I mean, let me put. It, I think the uh, within ten years, the only place you'll be seeing ads is on public television. Uh, you notice commercial-free public television, which begins every hour with five minutes of commercials. Uh, to one bank or insurance company uh, after another. So yeah, there's my prediction for you. Commercials will be restricted to public television. Yes. I was wondering, does the XL restrictions, what are the shows you think are the top tier shows that you have? You know, if I, if I went back to the 50s, uh, uh, you know, the greatest comedies were Sid Caesar, your show of shows, and the, uh, uh, the Sergeant Bilko show, uh, uh, the greatest western was have one were Gunsmoke and Have Gun Will Travel. Perry Mason. I mean, I I could go on and on uh, uh, about this. You know, I do think Seinfeld is one of the greatest shows of comedies. I think Cheers, the Dick Van Dyke Show. I mean, I have my own personal ca canon, but it would take hours to unfold. Uh, uh, <laughs> but there's lots of them, and it's kind of I've drawn up lists there. It's not quite as prolific as my list of the greatest movies. It's harder to do. Uh, a TV show at a consistent level of quality. That's what amazes me about shows like The Simpsons uh, and The X-Files. Certainly I would add South Park. Let me not let this opportunity go by without praising the one truly libertarian show on television. One more question, yes. I would like to ask you about uh, Six Feet Under. It's uh, a TV drama that was yeah, quite yeah. success in, in Europe, but I think that it's an, an example of uh, about the commercial success that, that can have some dramas for minorities, a minority maybe in each country in Europe or in America, it's enough for the uh, commercial success for the HBO. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't seen the show, so okay. But uh, one of the things uh, you could actually hear it in one of those was Fox uh, decided to pursue the opposite of broadcasting. I mean, it, it decided to go for segments of the audience. Uh, which had a real logic for advertisers. So Fox created some shows that were very attractive for young people, and then advertisers knew what to advertise on those shows. Fox um, uh, created a whole series of shows that African Americans liked. That they put the Wayans Brothers on and so on. And that wasn't because Rupert Murdoch is particularly liberal in his views, but because it was a commercial decision. But it had an excellent effect in giving a lot of African American talent a chance to appear on television. And again, it, 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 it allowed advertisers to target certain products. So uh, this is one of the fundamental ways in which television has changed. And I could see how it would have an impact on the varying uh, success of American shows abroad, uh, where they might pick up on uh, target audiences uh, 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 that they don't have at home in the United States. Uh, but that's a very good point. I mean, one of the great advantages of anyone producing in the United States is that the, uh, the United States market is so huge in itself. It virtually is self-contained. I mean, but, uh, and, you know, if you're producing television in Romania for the Romanian market, your, your possibilities are much more limited. There's just not that much money uh, in Romania. Uh, 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 but it is true that the American shows, if, American movies are now world-oriented. I mean, they, they absolutely crave the world audience. That's why movies have become silent again. You know, the great era of world movies was the silent era when the dialogue didn't matter, so you could show the same movie in any country. Most American blockbusters are essentially silent movies now. The dialogue doesn't matter. It doesn't care what someone said. You know, the spe special effects are silent movies. They're, they have the same virtue. You can sell a big special effects blockbuster all around the world. No one cares if you've dubbed it that. Help me, help me, uh, well or not in the other. And, and so television, American television, as far as I concern, can tell, is still completely oriented towards the American market. It may have unexpected consequences in foreign markets. And I suspect at some point, 
American television will follow the route uh, of American movies and, and people will start to produce with a foreign market in mind. Uh, you know, you see a little bit of it, uh, you know, the Simpsons, they know they're popular in Canada, so finally they gave them a sop, they did an episode in Canada, and I think that was done a bit with uh, uh, marketing things in mind, but as yet, as far as I can tell, American television is still uh, limited in its own horizons by America, but you're, it's a very interesting point that it probably is having uh, consequences abroad that ho uh, Hollywood hasn't figured out yet. Yeah, I think we have to stop here, but... We'll have one last session. <laughs>